Welcome to To The Point. Just two months into the legislative session and already the new Democratic majority is making their presence felt in a big way. The tax cut plan they wanted passed but was denied immediate effect, which killed the $180 direct payment to filers but paved the way for an automatic income tax cut for next year. Republicans did grant immediate effect to a billion-plus dollar plan for a new Ford battery plant in Calhoun County. The cooperation on that may have been tied to the change in the tax plan, and Democrats, along with three Republicans in the Senate, passed an expansion of the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act that now includes protections for sexual orientation and gender identity or expression, a priority for Democrats for years. But cooperation has not come easily, and new waters to be navigated include gun control measures that are sure to stir up battles along ideological lines. In addition to talking about the session so far and a troubling case of abuses of child labor locally, freshman Democratic Representative Phil Skaggs gives us his take on those gun bills coming up and says he wants to go even further. Representative, let's talk about what this first couple of months has been like for you. It has been a sea change with Democrats taking over the majority, first time in 40 years. And it's not just that, but it's that you have put forth a lot of legislation, passed a lot of big ticket bills. Just this past week, we were talking about the big project for Ford, the battery factory that will be in Calhoun County. Uh, give me your take the first couple of months. What's it been like? Well, it's been hectic. I just ran to this interview. Right. Uh, so uh, from committee meetings, I'm on appropriations. That's the budget. So a lot of work. In fact, I'm on the subcommittees of appropriations that oversee 85% of the of the budget, that's $79 billion, according to the governor's recommendation. Um, but the new Democratic majority ha has, as you said, hit the ground running uh, with some pretty uh, important bills. Uh, we've already cut taxes on uh, and, and returned to the system that we had before the Republican and the Snyder tax increases. So we've dialed it back for our seniors on the retirement tax uh, and gotten rid of that. And we've uh, quintupled, I think the governor says, uh, but that's multiplied by six, uh, the earned income tax credit or the working families tax credit. So that if you're working hard and playing by the rules in Michigan, um, the state is going to see that and we're going to support those families. So a uh, great deal of successes. We had the first supplemental passed uh, and then last night uh, it took us a little bit of time and the sun went down. Uh, but we eventually passed a bill which I think will be key uh, towards keeping the automotive industry here in Michigan, keeping manufacturing here in Michigan, which is our heritage. Uh, and I am glad that Democrats were responsible enough um, to do the right thing, even though it might be difficult politically, um, to make sure that our premier Fortune 500 company, Ford Motor Company, uh, stays here in Michigan. So it's been hectic. Um, but you know what? They didn't force me to come here. I ran to come here, uh, and I feel like I'm doing a, a, a learning a lot and meeting with a lot of stakeholders. I tell you, one of the great energizing things to happen was uh, yesterday, uh, the third graders from Lakeside Elementary in East Grand Rapids, where my daughters went and where I live still three blocks away, came and visited the Capitol. I was able to bring them on the floor. We had a great time, and that's really why we're here for those kids. I just want to make a quick point on the, the relief on the pension tax. Some of that is phased in, so I don't want people to be confused by that, right? Some of it is phased in, unfortunately, because of some arcane right. rules in the Senate. Um, uh, immediate effect did not happen for 4001, so right. there'll be a phase in and it'll take some time. So you have to be patient. Um, this is Lansing, uh, and although uh, Democrats have the majority and delivered on the promises that we make, it's going to take a little bit of time to get those that money into people's hands. I want to move on to something that is disturbing. You were upset by it. We were all surprised by it, or certainly I was. When we heard the revelation about child labor emanating in Grand Rapids, and without getting into all of the detail about it, we've reported on it a number of times. I know you and a number of your colleagues has, have said, you want to get to the bottom of this. You want to figure out what happened. What do we know about what happened? Well, what we know is I woke up on Saturday morning, uh, looked at uh, the New York Times, and saw a really uh, exhaustive uh, investigative report from a Pulitzer Prize winner. So this was a, this was a significant journalistic effort. You know, thank you in the fourth estate. 
um, that brought to light some of the worst practices that we could think of. Taking advantage of immigrant, immigrant children. Um, you know, the Statue, of Lib the Statue of Liberty says, bring us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. These kids came here because of horrible poverty uh, in their home country. Um, I think that we can give them the schooling um, and ensure that they are not being exploited in workplaces. So it was heartbreaking to read this story. 13-year-old children, 15-year-old children working third shift, 12-hour, 14-hour shifts in difficult factory conditions. Um, we've got to put an end to it. Immediately after I read it, I, I called up um, state government, the director of the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Um, also had a discussion with um, the uh, head of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I am confident uh, that we are going to get to the bottom of this, that we're going to protect these children, and that we're going to make sure um, that uh, the state is doing everything it can to enforce our labor laws. I think we need to strengthen our labor laws, uh, our child labor laws, um, and keep these kids safe. Also had talks with the Attorney General, so I'm confident that we are on the ball, but this was a systemic failure from these businesses um, to the federal government that left these children unattended and um, available for exploitation. That's a subject we will follow up with you on because this will be an ongoing process. But right now in the legislature, for the first time in a long time, there is gun legislation that has been introduced. Uh, there are hearings that are going on. The, the three basic outlined uh, bills would deal with red flag laws, with storage, and background checks. What is the hope that those bills will do, introduced by Democrats? What do you hope to, to do by passing those bills? I think it's very simple. I mean, we're hoping to balance human lives and our constitutional rights. And I think we found the correct balance for that. Um, there are thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of deaths, deaths in America uh, because of firearms. Um, and we need to have common sense legislation around this. Um, of course, it, you know, the, 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 the cause of this immediate look at it um, was the MSU shooting. Um, my daughter, my youngest daughter is 20 years old, so she's in college. She's out in California, but she called up her friends immediately uh, at Michigan State University. They were in the union and had to flee for their lives. These are kids who were born just a year or two after Columbine. They've lived with these active shooter drills since kindergarten. They've seen shootings across the country, from Parkland to here in Michigan at Oxford. Um, we owe them, and we owe the victims of crime, of domestic violence, um, the chance to live and to live without trauma. So as you said, there are three basic, outline, uh, three basic packages that we've put together. One is safe storage. If you have a child in your home, you can't leave your gun sitting in the underwear drawer. Um, you've got to have a trigger lock or have it in a safe. Um, background checks, uh, almost everyone thinks that we ought to be looking into the past criminal history, past domestic violence history of folks um, before we give them machines that are uh, made to kill. Um, and then red flag laws. Uh, these are extreme protection orders, so if a loved one uh, believes that, there, that a person with a firearm poses a threat to themselves uh, or, their, or society, that these guns, after going through a thorough judicial process, can be temporarily taken out of the home. When I was an East Grand Rapids City Commissioner, we had an individual who had barricaded himself in his household, had called his ex-wife and had talked about committing suicide or committing homicide. Um, the East Grand Rapids Police worked with Grand Rapids Police. Um, we were able to save that individual's life, make sure he didn't harm anyone else. Now, thankfully, our police chief was able to convince him to give up the, I think, two dozen weapons that were in his house, and he got the care that he needed. Um, but he only did that voluntarily. Our law enforcement needs to have the tools that when they see a dangerous situation about to happen, uh, that they have the ability to take guns away from those. There are two things that I hear most often from those people that oppose uh, some of this gun legislation from the Republicans. 
One is, and one of the folks that will be on this show today pointed out uh, that from her perspective, that none of those three measures would have changed what happened at MSU. That's from her perspective, and you can take the other side of that if you choose. And the other is when it comes to red flag laws, uh, they worry about due process. Can you reassure uh, some of the opponents of this that at some point you would probably like to have support some of these bills, uh, that the due process part when it comes to red flag laws will be followed? So I'll take a look at both of those. So the due process, yes, we have attorneys and experts from across the country looking at the laws that we're putting forward and making sure that there is a true due process, that these uh, red flags laws cannot be used by people who wanna have vengeance or a vendetta, think of an ex-boyfriend, an ex-girlfriend. Um, and those are serious concerns that we need to have. And we will depend on the judicial system, on the prosecutor, um, to be able to make sure that these uh, laws are not being abused. Um, the question about whether or not it could have changed the Michigan State shooting, um, the father of the shooter was very concerned about his son um, and was very worried about uh, the fact that he owned guns and was um, in a violent mindset and was clearly having some mental health issues. Had we had the red flag laws, would that father have called the police? Um, would he have called the proper authorities and maybe there could have been an intervention that could have saved lives? So I reject the notion that these laws would not have uh, uh, had an impact perhaps on the MSU show shooting. But while that is the impetus for the immediate action that we're taking, we know about gun violence in the United States of America. We're not just creating these laws about one incident. We're creating these laws about multiple incidents, mass shootings, domestic shootings, suicides, um, to try to save lives. And I think that's important. Uh, one quick note, and we're about out of time, because not only uh, do I have a time limit, but you have yet more meetings to yes. go to. Uh, talk to me a little bit about gun legislation that you'll be introducing. So I'm introducing gun legislation that will create a safe perimeter around government buildings, county commission buildings, uh, city halls, schools, universities that will prohibit the open carry of assault weapons. We've seen this uh, here across the street in our capital, that individuals came into the capital with open assault weapons uh, and clearly were threatening for political purposes um, senators who were working on legislation. We can't have that in a democratic republic. We cannot have the use of uh, battlefield weapons to try to intimidate our elected officials while they're doing the people's business. And we're going to take care of that here at the Capitol and here in this building, in the House building and in the Senate building. But we owe it to all the local governments, to the elected officials, to the staffs that work at these local government, but also to the people who are going to uh, a city commission hearing to hear about their garage variants or to let their opinion be known about a specific ordinance that's happening or, or, or a school policy. They deserve to be safe, to not have to walk into a building uh, and walk past a bunch of people uh, carrying what is really a machine gun um, and doing so for clear purposes of political intimidation. Uh, I think this is narrowly tailored. It's just open carry. It's just clearly defined assault weapons. Um, but I think that it will go a long way to cooling the temperature uh, around our politics. When I was a Kent County Commissioner and we were, deal we were dealing with the pandemic, um, although there wasn't a weapon shown, there were clear physical threats to our lives and our property of elected officials. Um, and we have to put a stop to that. We've got to get back to America as a place where we have discussion um, and elections uh, and we don't use uh, weapons of war to settle our political differences. When we come back, a conversation with another freshman, this time a Republican who has a much different take on gun legislation. You'll hear from Representative Gina Johnson next. To the point. Welcome back to To the Point. Republican Representative Gina Johnson is like our first guest, a freshman in the State House. And talk to me about the experience of being in Lansing the last two months. 
Representative, thank you for being here. We really haven't had a chance to talk much since the election. And I, I know you specifically want to talk about some gun legislation, and I, I think that's a, a conversation that we will be having ongoing here. We'll get to that in just a minute. But give me your take after two months in the legislature, being elected, into not being a Republican in the minority for the first time in mm -hmm. a long time. What's your experience been so far? Well, there's quite a learning curve for any freshman. Um, and my understanding is over half of the current House is uh, freshmen. So to me, that's a great opportunity for lots of good minds to come together. I don't care which party we're talking about. Good minds coming together with the vim and vigor and and some people think we're too idealistic but i think that's what we need we need some fresh um ideas with fresh energy and we can't worry about we really can't worry about whether we're in minority or majority we just got to plot ahead one day at a time uh finding meeting in the minds on everything we can do democrats are in control as we point out and so far uh, with the major legislation that they've pushed through, it has been, well, I guess with the exception of one Republican vote, it's been a uh, straight Democratic Party vote when it comes to the, uh, the tax bills. Um, is that the way this session is setting up, or is there going to be some cooperation across the aisle? I think there will be cooperation across the aisle. It's just going to vary from I issue to issue. Um, one of the Democrats actually voted no against their bill and one of our republicans voted yes with theirs it's a very thin line for getting anything through uh the democrat side if you will i really hate using the two-party system uh, and identification because it locks people into a box and we this is when we have to break out of the box and use common sense for what's best for the people of michigan but um Issue by issue, we're going to see people cross over and say, this is not going to work for the people in my district, if they care about whom they're representing. And to highlight what you're talking about, it's 56 votes to 54 votes. It takes 56 to pass anything. Keeping right. one caucus together on every vote is not possible, and right. so there will have to be some bipartisanship. Let's move on to what is going to be, I think, a hotly debated issue when it comes to legislation in your chamber it has not yet been introduced as we're talking mm -hmm. but even by the time this airs it may have been right. we know it's going to be and those are three gun laws that the governor was talking about last year even uh, before mm -hmm. the most recent shooting at michigan state university mm -hmm. and they are in the most rudimentary explanation red flag laws which would allow uh someone to preemptively take guns away from somebody if they believe they were going to hurt themselves or someone else, mm -hmm. uh, universal background checks, and also gun storage laws. Now, I know that doesn't, that's not complete, but I do know that you wanted to talk about that. Talk to me about your take on that and, and what that's going to look like when it comes to that conversation. Well, first of all, the whole topic of safety is great more encompassing than just looking at guns and more encompassing than just looking at some legislation and you know that but we're not going to do justice to this but we're going to do the best we can to at least cover it somewhat um the situation at msu and looking at the current uh legislation now i'm a mom i put my daughter through college and I remember sending her off to college and helping her understand you are going to be put into situations that you've never been in before. And you're now on a campus. And there are dangers. And without making them too terrified to go to college, um, I remember, this sounds funny, but I gave her a can of long-distance shooting raid. Because I said, honey, I think that's about your best bet. And a woman, a young woman, hand-to-hand -hand combat is, is you pray and hope for the best. But there's all sorts of things, you know, the, the, the challenge of rape, the challenge of if someone is on drugs or, or drunk, the challenge of a shooter. There's so many risks on a campus, and yet they're off campus too. The problem with on campus, one of the problems is not having enough security. Um, 
It's a gun-free zone, which I'm just going to be really strong here and tell you it irritates me as a mother, as an aunt of college-age nieces and nephews right now. Um, it's an invitation to gun crime. It's a criminal zone that we've designed, and it's not right. Um, these things have to be reevaluated. Now, looking at the 11 Senate bills, let's say they all passed. It will change nothing. It would have changed nothing about what happened at MSU. The problem at MSU is, number one, the former Ingham County prosecutor did not follow the law. And if we don't enforce the laws we currently have, how are we going to add more? We're not following the current laws. There are a substantial number of gun crimes that are committed that do end up in plea bargains. Mm -hmm. and, and that's across the board. It's not just in Ingham County. So there's a lot to unpack here, but let me mm -hmm. get to it piece by piece. Mm -hmm. When you say you want to enforce the laws, the current gun laws, do you want to change the sentencing structure for those? Or do you want to leave it there? Do, do you have the ability to prosecute all of those different gun crimes that happen across the state and incarcerate or do whatever the law calls for in each of those cases. I really hope that the former Ingham County prosecutor that is responsible for this crime at MSU um, is an exception. I personally would like an uh, investigation into how all the county prosecutors across the state of Michigan are handling gun crimes and, and safety issues in general. But she bragged about letting people off, putting gun criminals, felons, back in the street, put the guns back in their hands. We've got to give them second, third, and fourth chances. Now, I'm on the side of mercy in some situations, too, and I, th I love second chances, but not when it's this dangerous. She shouldn't have been county prosecutor if this is her attitude. Maybe she should be a social worker. Maybe she should have done something else in her life. This is not the role of a county prosecutor to get as many down to plea bargain, plea bargain down to misdemeanors so that they can be let back on the streets. He had a gun crime already. He should have been a felon. He would never have been able to purchase the two 9 millimeter guns legally. Yes, he could have gotten them illegally like many gun crimes are. That's Chicago. The big gun-free zone example, Chicago, with tons and tons of crime. We cannot go in that direction. The Senate bill, the Senate bill package, would head us in the direction of more crime and we would look like Chicago. We're going to run out of time, but I, I want to be very clear. You've mentioned it twice, gun-free zones. You say it's an invitation uh, to become a, a crime zone. Would you advocate doing away with the gun-free zones at Michigan State and other places? West Virginia just did this. They have a carry-on campus, new ruling by their legislature and their governor. Um, we need to look at letting people defend themselves, a right to defend yourself. And the, the other part of this, this Senate bill package is taking those kinds of rights away from law-abiding Michigan citizens, and it even includes hunting regulation, which is just preposterous. We're not talking about hunting. But now it includes all firearms, not just pistols and handguns. Is that the storage component that you're it's talking about? Every, every bill says firearms. It no longer says handguns and pistols. So what is your take? What are Republicans, if this is a Republican-Democrat issue, what are Republicans proposing as you move forward? Because there are a whole lot of anxious parents mm -hmm. all over the country, and it's certainly mm -hmm. come home to roost right here in Michigan. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there something that can be done legislatively? Other than, than, you know, there, there are going to be a whole lot of folks that aren't going to be comfortable being armed on campus. Um, but uh, many who are and some of the little artwork they've thrown around on paintings on the big stones on campus are already asking for that. Please let us defend ourselves. Um, first of all, we have a, a bill package that was already designed before this MSU incident, bipartisan, for better protocols on schools, school campuses. Um, more communication, more standards, more um, Get, get terminology straight so one school communicates with the next and ready to go security measures, okay? That's already in process, bipartisan. 
This is not a Democrat versus Republican, Republican versus Democrat issue. This is common sense and safety. We all want safety. It's just how we're going to get there. And we look at the research. We need more mental health treatment options. Um, Oakland County states that, you know, in 1999, 8% of the people in jail were on psychotropics, antipsychotics. Now it's 43%. Obviously, we have a mental health issue. We need to involve faith-based organizations to participate in being community support, offering the free counseling some of them have and do very well. We need to pull in everybody now to build up the culture while we allow people to um, safely and with good training defend themselves. And we need to do this in a bipartisan manner. There's no reason we can't. We all want the same result. We're out of time, but I need to know how you feel about this bipartisan mm -hmm. plan that you say is already out there versus the one that's been introduced in the Senate. Does that have a chance of going anywhere? Absolutely, because it's already largely Republicans and Democrats agreeing on it. It was introduced in the last session, and we're just continuing it on. And this is with good training, protocol, communication, and standards on every school campus in Michigan. When we come back, a look ahead and a final thought. So far, the new legislative session has taken a different path than those of the recent past with less regular order, more hurriedly pushed through legislation while Democrats continue to fulfill their agenda and, by the way, their campaign promises at record speed. Will the legislature settle into a more normal pattern as we go ahead or will pending gun legislation only serve to make the atmosphere even more divisive in Lansing? It's something we'll be watching every week. To the point.